All right, folks, welcome to the second Alyssa webinar for spring 2021. My name is Michael Crossfox. I'm coming to you from the Queens campus and I'm joined today by two very special guests and we'll just get the ball rolling. Uh, today's topic is LIS internships and our guests are Kat Baumgartner and Kevin Quinn. Uh, so let's get the ball rolling. If you would just uh, take a moment to introduce yourselves, folks. All right, hello everybody. I'm Kat, I'm a children's librarian at the Great Neck Library. Hey, uh, I'm Kevin. Uh, I am a digital imaging specialist at NARA in uh, College Park, Maryland. What is NARA? Uh, National Archives and Records Administration. Thank you, sir. And Kevin did not submit his headshot to me, so he's being played in the presentation accurate, accurate. by Mr. Peabody. There you go. All right, folks, so let's dive right in. Uh, get it? Dive right in, and we're looking mm -hmm. at the ancient. Oh, yeah. uh, the two of you shared an experience during your time in DLIS as interns over a summer with, I want to say, the Fire Island Historical Society. Uh, Kat, do you want to start telling us about that project? Yeah, sure. It was. Um... On Fire Island specifically, it was the Point of Woods Historical Society. It was the um, one of their communities that they have there, and it's a very insular community. So we were working on digitizing all of the records that they have there, I think especially because they're prone to uh, more inclement weather than we are. So they were a little nervous about the uh, the photograph. It was mainly photographs um, that they had that they were worried about, you know, getting destroyed even just by, like, I guess the saltier air being close to the water. So we were scanning and uploading those into, I believe it was Omeka, who was the website. Mm -hmm. yeah, open yeah. source. <laughs> it's been a little while. Free. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, we were just uploading all of that with the metadata and trying to preserve their documents for future generations. Cause it was a very, uh, family oriented and, uh, a lot of generations. Uh, people have been there for many generations back. So it was a very family oriented community. Yeah. How long, how long was the posting? Uh, for a month and a half. It? I think we were there yeah, a month and a half, two five, months almost. Weeks. Yeah, yeah. We we're close to two months. Um, yeah, and it was it was residential, which was really special, right? Yeah. How, did you, how did you hear yeah. about it, Kat? I believe it was a posting from your newsletter. That's right. <laughs> Check the digest. <laughs> And Kevin, after, in addition to that, you did a second internship, I believe, right after your after you had completed your coursework, mm -hmm. you you went that summer after graduating. You did a zero credit internship. How did that yeah. work out for you? Um, it, I I think it worked out really well. Um, I, I knew that I needed some more experience under my belt. You know, we had done a ton in the, like the two years that that we had been in the program, but I just felt like I needed something else. Um maybe to kind of like walk me into a position after graduating. So uh, I got a, uh, an internship with the uh, audio visual library of the United Nations in New York. Um, and from there, I, uh, I did a month and a half, uh, two months. I'm trying to remember, it might have even been three months, but um, did, a, did an internship there for the General Assembly, which is when all the world leaders come. Uh, they need like all hands on deck, so you have everybody um, cutting videos um, in the in the media center. Uh, it, it's really a it's really a wild experience if, uh, if you're not familiar with it. So if, if I would definitely check uh, check that out because I believe that they are always looking for interns. And um, after my internship, it actually led into a like three month temporary position, which is uh, something pretty normal at the United Nations. They do a lot of temporary jobs. And then, uh, you know, after a certain amount of time, you take this test and then you can become a permanent uh, employee there. But um, yeah, it was a really great experience and uh, it was really helpful for my career. Right. And it's it's for that reason that we um, at St. John's College, we don't award academic credit for uh, paid internships. So I, I still process those and, and distribute, disseminate that information. But for our students, we have to consider those as temporary jobs uh, just because it's project based. It really gives you good experience. And, you know, here you had you went from this kind of uh, had said insular, but I'm going to say podunk kind of uh, historical collection out in the out in the, you know, literally on an island. Um, to then working for a global organization, even in a temporary capacity, that shows on your resume a range of skill and a range of scale that I think is valuable to prospective employers. Which brings us to our next topic. Um, 
So this is the new functionality in PowerPoint where you nice. put like these GIFs as a background. And or GIFs, either way. Oh, no, it's no. GIFs. It's GIFs. <laughs> And uh, it's based it's based on the constant of the slide. So it suggested there were some like fields of grain waving in the, and you know gr grassy fields. But I thought this is good because we're getting our careers up and running. Sure, track and field, yeah, of course. Right. Killing it with so, the puns today. Yeah, um, my pun game, the coffee has kicked in. Everything has, has, has not slipped in the years that I've known you. <laughs> so uh, let's talk about the relationship between your field experience and your search for employment. Kat, how, what, what part did it play? Did you bring up academic service learning, your internships? Like, what was the experience of trying to get a job after your internship? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even for entry level positions, it definitely helps having some experience under your belt so because i was uh, a lot of the internships that i did were archival based so you know i did the um, academic service learning at suny farmingdale creating the um uh finding aids it's been a while looking <laughs> find words um, so i think it was really um for the position that i'm in right now in a public library i think it was really my experience working as a trainee at floral park that um you know really helped boost my uh, ability to speak on my interview to things that I could bring to the table um, coming in, even as, you know, a very, very recent graduate with no full time work experience. Yeah, I think the, the field experience that you gain from internships and from the part time jobs is absolutely invaluable in trying to trying to land a job after graduation. Talk a little more about the trainee position. How many credits were required before you could take that job? I believe that was 12 credits. I think that's the uh, standard for a trainee position. And I mean, depending on the library uh, at Floral Park, and I know here at Great Neck, you really are essentially a librarian. Um, you do obviously get training, but the projects that they give you, it's it's something any part-time librarian would be working on. So they don't treat you as necessarily, um, you know, an intern or a trainee, like the, the title is. Um, so you really do get a lot of hands-on experience. Like I was able to, I remember in my job interview here at Great Neck, they asked me specifically what experience I had with weeding. And at Floral Park, I was the only, um, there was only one full-time children's librarian there. So I was the only part-time children's librarian and the full-timer had me doing all of the weeding there. So I was able to say, you know, I completed this huge project and I would be able to do the same thing here and bring those skills that I learned to this new job. So it, it definitely helps. And what was your experience, Kevin, with the link between internship and full-time employment? Yeah, I, I found that um, just getting work experience under my belt early on, like early and often, uh, was probably the most beneficial part of um, a lot of like the work experience that I had pre where I am now. Um, I, mean, I think a lot of times people get uh, you know caught up in the trying to find like the perfect situation the perfect internship things like that but i i kind of like i took things as they came and it you know it, it you know i i say it worked out like it you know I'm, maybe not always work out but um you know I, I took chances i you know i i knew that you know there's like an internship cycle every you know every year so you know internships will pop up um, if not your first year, your second year, and, you know, you have more opportunities. Um, when I was in, you know, interviews, they, they would always ask, like, you know, what's, what's your hands-on experience? And having, you know, having the knowledge, I think, you know, I, and I, I may be, you know, repeating that, that cliche tagline, but, like, you learn in school, but you, you gain that experience outside that is just so valuable. And, um, I mean... You know, I when, when I applied for the position that I'm current or the position that I was in, or you know, my, my entry level position, it was you know that experience really helped me set me apart from some of the other candidates. So um, that field experience I had in the two years, it was like 2015, 2017, was, was just amazing and pretty invaluable. Yeah, I want to emphasize something that Kevin said. It's like, you're absolutely right what they teach you in school. I mean, I think it's a little bit different archival versus like public libraries, but there are some things that you have to just learn from experiencing it, especially mm -hmm. with the public. So it, it really is a, a great tool to enhance um, the things that you're learning in school that you won't necessarily get from a textbook. Yeah, this is something that we've encountered. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard because as you work and as your career progresses and you advance in the field or 
um, you, you work a series of jobs, uh, you kind of take for granted what you learn. And it's very subtle. It's, it's sometimes very subtle, nuanced things. For instance, I had a student worker when I started in DLIS, she was undergrad, and Dr. Rio needed a document copied and collated. And so I handed it to this 18-year-old freshman and said, copy it and collate. And an hour later, Dr. Rio came over to me and said, hey, did you, did you get those copies done? And I said, oh, let's go check on the student work and we walked over to the copy machine and the poor thing had like piles we needed five copies and she had like five piles of paper going and she was you know putting each sheet down and i could see the papers that she had misaligned and the copy came out kind of slanted or crooked and i said i i took for granted that this kid would know how to make copies right and then when you get to certain enterprises how do you answer the telephone and what's the protocol for answering the telephone and transferring a call do you warm the call up or do you just call transfer like it's little things like that that you are not mindful of at the beginning but having that hands-on experience especially as an intern or a trainee you're a little more hyper aware of what you're doing what you're being asked to do and how you're performing um, so you know now i take for granted that i just answer the phone I, I i used to the first time it happened to me but my first job was in retail and i answered every phone <laughs> you know thank you for calling so and so how can i help you and it's like oh i'm home <laughs> But even the even the terminology too, because I remember when I started here at Great Neck, my supervisor said to me, uh, "You know, we warm calls up before we transfer." And I, I was like, "What does that mean?" Yeah, I just I kind of like picked up on it from what you guys are talking about, but yeah, I didn't know that either. So I mean, oh, so warming go. up a call is when you yeah. call the extension and get a human being and tell them briefly why you're transferring the call to them, and then you transfer the call, Got right? It. So that. They say, oh, hi, you know, I, Michael told me what, you, what, what you're looking for and so on. So that's more you want to call. Career hack. There you know. There you go. Learn something new every day. All right. So how do, how do we find internships? Um, of course, the university offers career services and the Handshake platform. Our students can access that through sign-on. Uh, here in DLIS, as Kat mentioned, and we'll forever be grateful, we do uh, compile current listings of internships in the Student Digest and on the blog. You can search the category internships. And you can also check out professional associations uh, like the American Library Association or the New York Library Association, and they'll have internship postings for uh, internships and trainee positions in uh, public libraries and state libraries. And there's also institutional and organization websites. So that's if you want to do an internship at the United Nations, uh, like Kevin did, you go to the United Nations website and see what postings are available there. So you can always think of that. Think of how you want to develop your career uh, and always identify institutions, a dream institution. You want to work for the Library of Congress? Start looking now. See how you can get your foot in the door. You want to work at uh, the Lord L'Oreal Color Lab and be the hair dye librarian, start looking now and, and get your foot in the door. So, you know, there's a lot of places to find this work. Uh, it's just a matter of practice and, and getting out there and getting into the field. So how did you describe, this is an example I have on screen. Uh, these bullet points on the left come from an actual posting that uh, I got this week. And then on the right is how I would describe it on my resume. So when you think of, of something that maybe you didn't expect to, to, to encounter in your internship and how you would describe it in uh, your resume, Kat? Um, well, you know, I, rem I do remember when I worked, uh, I interned at the New York City Economic Development Corporation um, the same summer that we did the Fire Island internship. And I remember there was uh, actually someone on the team there who went out of her way to work with me on how I could bullet point the, uh, the job duties that I was doing on my resume so that it would... Uh, you know, translate well to potential tasks I would have on jobs in the future. I'm trying to think if there was anything specifically. Um, well, while you think, Kevin, do you have anything? Uh, sure. Yeah, I think um, it, I, it's pretty relevant because it's something that I've had to do a couple of times since, uh, since I left. But um, looking at the job posting itself uh, and using language from that job posting, um, you know, a lot of times you're going to have, uh, you know, related words uh, that are in your resume that aren't necessarily in uh, the job posting. And, you know, there's these, uh, these systems now that like they're looking for keywords and catch words and they want to, you want to match what you're putting on your resume um, as closely as possible as you can to the, the postings on 
uh, that the organization or, or the agency or whatever, or the library or, you know, that they're putting out um, because there, there is a system that's in place to kind of weed that out. So, um, yeah, I, I guess, you know, my, my little, like, tip or key would be to, to check out the job posting and do your best to try and um, tailor your resume to that. And if that means that you have a couple of different versions of your resume, it does get annoying. I think that's like my biggest, like, uh, it makes me feel so uh, weird that I have like five or six different versions of my resume, but it was one of the biggest, uh, biggest, you know, boons to, to my internship rather hiring process. Yeah, and I think that the one thing that I tell people is um, I mean, Kevin's talking about like public jobs. And so those are kind of, there's more bureaucracy. Kat also has a public job, but those are really, um, when you have to engage with those kind of HR systems, um, I try to avoid those. And so I really only look at job postings and, and scholarship postings, uh, sorry, internship postings that are uh, it'll be like employment at the institution, like send your resume and cover letter to this email address. Mm -hmm. And that ups your chances of landing in a person's hand uh, rather than being screened by an algorithm and being picked out. That's like that matching game and, and the oh, source. Oh, it's it's horrible. And that yeah. we all somehow accept that there's a robot that's going to mm -hmm. decide if I can eat and pay rent is bananas. Brutal. So, you know, if, if you can have the choice, if, if this is a, a point of privilege, but we are a grad program, so you should exercise, you should flex some kind of muscle in that you have a master's degree. Try to identify the institutions where you have a, a the, the point of contact is a lot closer than a system. Um, and like I said, some public jobs are definitely, this internship uh, that I'm going about to talk about, um, well, let me just talk about it. Uh, so we have a, a wonderful opportunity this summer in 2021, uh, an alumnus, um, he became a prison librarian and he works in a correctional facility uh Woodburn, New York, in Sullivan County. And he arranged for three library intern positions to occur this summer. Um so you know, prison librarianship is something that's kind of insular. We don't have a lot of exposure to it. Uh this internship is a pilot program that he was able to organize. Uh, it does require that you register through the New York State Employment Portal as an intern candidate and then apply for the, the, the position. So that's a big system. That's a very robust state employment database. Uh, check the student digest. It's gonna be posted on there until uh, it, the positions are filled. Uh, he's only offered it, I, I told him to offer it to um, SUNY Buffalo that has an online program also, uh, even though Sullivan County, New York is not really close to Buffalo, New York, thank God. Uh, but there may be students in that, you know, central Hudson, I think it's the capital region or the Hudson region, whatever it's called. Um, so yeah, there may be students floating around up there. Uh, but yeah, so when, we, when we're looking for internships, definitely, and you'll find this with the cultural institutions like the museums and archives, it'll, it'll say internships at Metropolitan Museum of mm -hmm. Art org instead of going through uh, you know Silk Road or Indeed or any of those kind of resume matching databases uh, they want candidates to uh, apply directly and understand also here's the caveat a lot of the internships that are in the digest are offered to our students almost exclusively and those are from cultural partners. They're from alumni uh, who know our program and know the uh, quality of our students. So it's not, I'm not scouring the net for the dredges of internships. People are handing them to me on a silver platter and I'm making them available to our students because you guys are worth it. So uh, that being said, keep your eyes on the digest. Uh, mm -hmm. Any final words of wisdom, Kat? Anything? That I, this is the question that I'm, ans I'm asking everybody at the end of uh, the webinars now. What one thing surprised you the most when you started your job that you, was not covered in library school? Oh, where do I start? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very loaded question. <laughs> Um, I mean, like I said earlier, I think it's that element of working with the public and not necessarily knowing what to expect or how to handle certain situations that do crop up. Um, it, that that was a definite learning curve. And I think having some of that on the job experience from my trainee position definitely helped prepare me for some of that to like a lesser degree. It wasn't like I was just being thrown into it full time all of a sudden. Um, yeah, I think that was the biggest that and just the way some of the administrative elements 
work in a in a public institution, especially in one as big as the the system that I'm in now. Kevin, one major surprise. <laughs> um, I know this is going to sound uh, like I'm I'm sucking up here, but how prepared I was um, <laughs> with the uh, with with the program, like with everything that I had done at St. John's. Um, I, I think that I was o over prepared in a, you know, maybe I don't want maybe not over prepared, but you know, I was I was sufficiently uh, prepared for what the work that I was going to be doing. Um, you know, I felt like I was just like, oh, like, you know, idea. I was an ideas guy, you know, and I was like brand new. You know, I'm like, oh, like, we could do this. You know, I felt like I was way, way more up on uh, on on the new, um, you know, uh, uh, metadata styles. And it, it just like it, there were so many there were so many different aspects of school that I was like trying to apply to. Um, my, my work. So I think, yeah, um, I was surprised how like prepared and like beyond prepared that was. That's good. Who, who were you? Uh, who was your faculty? You were a GA, right? Who was your faculty? Yeah, uh, Dr. Angel. Okay, Dr. Angel. Yep. Points for Dr. Angel on yeah. uh, <laughs> preparing you yep. for the real world. Absolutely. Absolutely. I was, I was ready to hit the ground and running. So I felt pretty good about that. That's good. And I want to remind students uh, watching this that, you know, I'm here to help. So if you need help uh, getting real world, real world or hands on experience, uh, you can reach out to me. And I am, it's not, you know, it's part of my job and I love doing it. So speaking of my job, let's go over some housekeeping. Uh, the next Alyssa webinar is going to be on March 11th and the subject is going to be the DLIS e portfolio, uh, your end of program assessment. If you're in your first semester, you can tune in and learn about the e-portfolio process. If you're in your last semester uh, and I see you in this webinar and you ask what is an e-portfolio, <laughs> I will put on my mask and go to where you are and you'll find out. <laughs> this is my mask. Oscar the Grouch. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> uh, the March 25th Alyssa webinar, the topic is TBD because I had a speaker, her office is moving that week and so she's unable to do it because she doesn't know where she's going to be in the world. Uh, Easter recess is going to take place over April 1st to 5th and then on April 8th we'll hear some from, uh, we'll hear from some professional associations about the value of joining a professional association and getting involved. Uh, Kat can speak to that herself. She's part of the Nassau County Library Association Pop Culture Committee, uh, which is having an event on March 25th, right? Yes, we are. That is uh, appropriation versus appreciation and planning thoughtful programs around that. We have some great panelists lined up. So that program is also in the digest. So our students are more than welcome. It's a free virtual event. Uh, you don't have to be a member of NCLA. No. Right. And then our final webinar for the semester will be April 22, and that's Dr. Vorbach's Director's Forum. He's going to talk to us about his goals, what we did, what we accomplished this semester, uh, maybe plug some summer classes, uh, and that's the end of housekeeping. As always, you can contact me directly, cruzm at stjohns.edu. And finally, every webinar going forward will end in a heartfelt tribute to our beloved <laughs> Pizza Cat served us valiantly for five years as the Delissa mascot and Delissa webinar mascot and Delissa webinar sponsor. I'm not wearing my pizza socks today. I've got my Brennan Stimpy socks on because I, I just can't bring myself to put the pizza cat socks on anymore. All right, it's folks. A sad day. It's a sad day. They killed my cat, y'all. <laughs> All right, kids. Well, thanks for tuning in uh, and uh, have a good one. Yeah, thanks.